Today I'm gonna do a one big summary video on this new concept of what causes cancers and the reason why I want to do this is because I did a series of videos explaining this already and how you're supposed to treat cancer according to this uh, new theory. But this is the first paper by the same group of authors who proposed this new theory that I read because I was so interested in this and I'm gonna give you a quick summary of this quick and then um, that will wrap th wrap up this series. So basically what are we talking about here? This is a, a theory called mitochondria stem cell connection. There's two theories combined into one and what these guys basically talk, what this theory talks about is that all cancers arise because of mitochondria mitochondrias inside our cells stop functioning properly. Mitochondria are these tiny little organelles or section of your cell that is responsible for producing ATP and more specifically th they stop producing ATP via this one specific pathway called oxidative phosphorylation and in order for cancer to happen this failure of mitochondria has to happen inside stem cells. When this happens, these stem cells then become cancerous stem cells, and this is what eventually will lead to cancer development. And the key element here, another key element is, th is that because this oxidative, oxidative phosphorylation is no longer working, cancer cells become absolutely dependent on glucose and glutamate as their food source or fuel source, and if you remove that fuel source, that food source, you will kill those cancer cells. And the key here is to specifically kill those cancer stem cells because that is the ultimate troublemaker. All right, so that's the theory in a nutshell. The authors remind us there's a number of different theories that have been proposed over the years. Let me give, spell them out really quick uh, to you again. The first one was the mitochondria respiration theory that it's broken, which is the same theory these guys are talking about. It was one of the earliest proposed in 1920s already. Imagine if this, because how cancer, what causes cancer is all still theoretical. Imagine if this theory turns out to be true and we and we already could have been treating cancer according to this theory for over a hundred years if this turns out to be true and yet we completely ignore it. We, we act as if this theory doesn't even exist when it comes to cancer treatment. All right, so that was the first one. The most prevalent one is the somatic mutation theory. Somatic means any cell that is not, not reproductive cells in your body, so basically all your cells making up your body except the reproductive cells, are, they're called somatic, and this is specifically what it says is that it's DNA mutations, mutations in the genetic code inside these cells. You need one or more mutations in order to cause cancer. So that's the most prevalent theory that, it, that we have adopted in medicine. This is also the theory I've been training on my whole life, scientific life as well. So this is also why I was so interested in this concept that these authors propose, propose because it's something very different and they argue effectively against this theory. So I was quite interested in, in this theory for that very reason as well. And um, more recent theories uh, is the cancer stem cell theory that basically uh, means that all you need stem cells that, are, that become cancerous in order to cause cancer and grow the tumor and so on. And then the, uh, there's another one called uh, tissue organization theory. And that theory talks about the fact that cancer is caused because of the fact that tissue is not developed properly. It's the, it's certain cells are becoming disorganized. So th those are the, the different theories. So the first part of the paper that they really go into, they talk about they try to basically put down that somatic mutation theory. So then somatic mutation theory, again, you need mutations in a genetic, genetic code in order to cause cancer. And the way they argue about it, uh, against it, is the fact that, look, really, there is almost never can, can the mutation be truly appropriately linked to the start of cancer. That is extremely hard to prove. And, um, and, how cancer starts at the very early stages is actually quite murky. So we're really still missing a lot of pieces of understanding of what is going on there. And another thing is if, if you sequence or decode the genetic code of every single cell inside a cancer, and it could be like thousands of cells, imagine if you decoded every single one, you, if, if it was genetic mutations causing cancer, you would think that there would be a lot of same mutations being prevalent in the cancer and the author saying it's actually not the case. It's very 
what they call het heterogeneous, meaning it's super variable what these mutations are. So there's lots of different mutations. And uh, rather what the authors propose is that, yes, there are mutations taking place, but they are not the cause of cancer, they are byproduct of cancer. And we'll explain that as well in a, in a moment. But, but um, you know, I could argue against some of, some of that, uh, some of these concepts, but they also brought up other really interesting arguments I wanted to share with you as well. And basically it is the fact that not all carcinogens, for example, cause mutations. So that completely negates this theory, right? And then you can also have the concept that um, you can ha also have carcinogens or you can have substance substances that are completely inert. They never will cause any mutation, right? And they can ca cause cancer, right? So, so, so there is that. But you can also have cancer, what would be cancer driver mutations inside normal healthy cells, or you can also see, um, see these in uh, different diseases that are not cancer, such as um, rheumatoid arthritis. So that I thought was um, interesting, interesting arguments against the somatic cancer theory. So again, they propose that the mutations are a byproduct and not the cause of cancer. Now, in terms of, um, and, uh, in terms of uh, carcinogens not always causing mutations, um, that might be the case, but what they do mention is that carcinogens do do one cause, they do cause one thing, and that is they always seem to break down the proper function of mitochondria. So now let's talk about the second section of that, of that first publication they did, where they amalgamated two theories, the mitochondria being broken down and that it needs to happen inside stem cells, hence the mitochondria stem cell connection theory, that's how they call it. So they just combine two old theories together. And basically, faulty mitochondria is present at every stage of cancer development. So we're talking about that at the stage of the initiation, growth, survival, and then e spread or metastasis. And you always need faulty mitochondria. And if you analyze cancer cells, all the studies that ever looked at mitochondria of cancer cells, they always either have fewer mitochondria than the normal healthy cells, and they also have altered morphology than what the normal healthy mitochondria would look like inside he normal healthy cells. And uh, lastly, they also always have that broken oxidative phosphorylation, that specific metabolic pathway that produces a lot of ATP, lots of that energy we need. And as a consequence, this is why cancer needs that other fuel sources. They call it fermentable fuels, and that's glucose and glutamate. All right, so that's... That's where the, where the mitochondria comes in. But, but um, what's really interesting here is also the next set of experiments they described that, that I've, I found was very convincing. And that is this. If you take the nucleus of a cell that is cancerous cell, meaning that that's the nucleus that's supposed to have all that broken DNA inside that called, caused cancer, and you then take a cytoplasm or basically the liquid with everything inside that's inside the cell, and you combine it with the nucleus of a cancerous cell, then... That, that composition will no longer be cancerous or vice versa. Or you could do it, do it this way. You could take normal healthy cell and you can isolate broken mitochondria from cancer cells and put them into normal healthy cell and you will make that cell cancerous or vice versa. You can take a cancer cell that obviously has broken mitochondria and if you inject normal healthy mitochondria inside that cancer cell you can heal that cell so the, this really shows you how powerful mitochondria really that is indeed is inside inside uh, in terms of uh, having a role for for cancer and when it comes to why would genetic mutations be a byproduct well when you don't have oxidative phosphorylation this metabolic pathway that normally takes place inside normal healthy mitochondria, then what, as a consequence of that, such broken mitochondria do produce lots of reactive oxygen species, and these are dangerous. I've I've mentioned that many times in my in my videos. They can be very can be used as a powerful weapon, but if you have too by our by ourselves, but if you have too much of it, the ray, um, the, this reactive oxygen species can start to mutate your own DNA. And voila, this is how you can get those bystander mutations, bystander mutations as well. And on top of that, if you start accumulating this rate of reactive oxygen species inside cells, this is where you can start activating oncogenes. Those are the genes that you need to be activated in order for cell to become cancerous. 
and or vice versa start suppressing tumor suppressor genes and those are the genes that control your cell to make sure it doesn't become cancerous so that's reactive oxygen species basically how it could be contributing to causing these mutations that we're observing all, all the time in cancer cells but again the, they're saying this is a bystander uh, effect okay so and not the cause all right so then next thing is what about those cancer stem cells and uh, why are they necessary so they're saying first of all Cancer stem cells are always present in all cancers, and you always need them to initiate cancers. So they, for example, recounted an experiment where some scientists took something like 100 cancer stem cells and injected them into some animal or some animal model, and that was, that was enough to cause cancer. But when they took non-stem cells that were cancer cells but not non-stem cells, even 10,000 of those together when they were injecting it that could not cause cancer, right? So, and they're saying that approximately every cancer tumor approximately uh, makes up about 2% of its composition will be those cancer stem cells. Now, they're saying they're also very important for metastasis. Why? Because stem cells have the capacity to regenerate continuously. They can produce new cells all the time, number one, and they can also become any cell as well. So this is why they're such a good candidate to, met, to cause cancer somewhere else. But in order for that to happen, they have to get inside your bloodstream. And they can do that very well. And, and the authors remind us, you need something else, another type of cell to, in order to achieve metastasis, and that's macrophages. Macrophages are immune cells. They can get inside our bloodstream. They call it, I think they call it intravasate into the bloodstream. They can literally squeeze in between the, the cells that make up the walls of the, of the blood vessel and get inside there to start doing their, their job. But they apparently can fuse with cancerous stem cells. This process, they call it, called it fusion hybridization. And together, they can then get into the bloodstream. And this is how you can start metastasize. However, I'm going to tell you in another video, another super interesting theory that has only been recently proposed, which brings cholesterol into, into cancer development and potentially metastasis. So stay tuned for that because that is a crazy story in, it, in its own right, okay? And I think that's also relevant to, to this theory that we're talking about uh, right, right now. Now, when it comes to treatment, this is the last, last part of, of that paper. They talked about treatment. So right now, the treatments that we're using for cancers they're mentioning they're not that effective. And the primary purpose of all the cancer treatments is based on that somatic mutation theory, what we're trying to do is stop replication of DNA or stop cells from dividing. And so those are the different cancer treatments that we're using currently at the moment, right? But this does not help the mitochondria and it does not help to restore oxidative phosphorylation. Oh, by the way, and if you restore oxidative phosphorylation inside cancer cells, you kill them, especially those cancer stem cells. So this is, check out my past videos when I talk about how they propose how you could potentially be treating cancers in order to achieve that very purpose. Now the cancer, the standard cancer treatments don't do this. Sometimes they can even make oxidative phosphorylation even worse inside cancer cells. As a consequence, sometimes what you can what can happen is is overall the the improvement based on all of the new medications we've had has been lackluster. It hasn't been that great. And actually, the statistic they mention is is unbelievable. They mentioned that over the last fifteen years, this overall survival rate based on these new cancer medications improved by about 2.4 increase of months, month increase of survival rate for cancer patients over the last 15 years, which is very, very little. And over the last 30 years, there was maybe 3.4 months improvement in survival rate for cancer patients. So not really, nothing to brag about. Luckily, the stats suggest that we're... Um, fewer people uh, at least are dying from cancers and there's fewer incidents. Um, per capita, so that's good. But overall, the treatments are not necessarily that great. And if you consider that mitochondria is being affected, that they suggest this opens up new possibilities for treatments, and that is basically restoring that oxidative phosphorylation, number one, and potentially targeting those macrophages as well, right? So there, so there is that. 
And what they remind us is that this is part, potentially far more effective way to go after because oftentimes when you treat cancer, cancer patients with the modern standard therapies, there might be very good effect. It looks really good. But then again, what happens is cancer comes back and becomes even more resistant to the treatment. Uh, and then do we observe metastasis and a, can and a patient dies. And they mentioned that basically 90% of all cancer patients die because of metastasis. So that's the primary reason of uh, the failure. And you need those cancer stem cells in order for that to happen. But here's the problem. Whenever you target the, the fast dividing cells, or when you target the DNA replication, well, when it comes to dividing cells, they mentioned these cancer stem cells, often they, they are not, uh, they're quiescent, so they're not in. Sorry about that, as always, I ran out of memory and I didn't realize. Anyway, I was talking about how you really need to kill cancer stem cells because if you treat cancer and you're trying to target fast dividing cells and cancer stem cells are not dividing fast, they're quiescent, you will not kill them. And you might, it might look like you destroyed everything. It might, the PET scans might look great. This positron uh, emission uh, tomography um, and the authors remind us, by the way, like they, they will not detect those cancer stem cells because how does it work? It worked the, that, that PET scan works with the fact that you provide that radioactive glucose or radio, radioactive glutamate. Remember, cancer cells absolutely need that fuel source because of the fact that oxidative phosphorylation is not working. So you can give that radioactive glucose or glutamate and see on a PET scan where the cancer is because the cancer cells will literally take up that fuel source. And they're mentioning like the detection limit for the PET scan is four millimeters. Now, one millimeter tumor has already something like 10,000 cells or 100,000 cells and a five millimeter tumor size, so very, very small, is already 10 million cells. And, uh, and remember, there's 2% of these will be about those, those cancer stem cells. So if you're not targeting those and you might not be able to target them with, with standard therapies, then even on a PET scan, you might, it might look like cancer is gone, but you might have a very, very tiny, tiny tumors that will not be visible at all because the, the technology is not powerful to see it. And there is enough stem cells in there for cancer to come back. And now these stem cells could even have been trained to become resistant to the treatment that was just last time. So they, the authors do mention like, this is the potential we should be looking at, at targeting the cancer stem cells with specifically activating this oxidative phosphorylation and possibly also target uh, target the the macrophages the immune cells that's that according to these authors might be helping cancer growth and together that's the new method check out my past videos where i mentioned because they also published that information in terms of how to uh, achieve that as well all right, so basically this was that, that other paper that they published. I wanted to share that with you because it was full of super interesting information for me and it explains in greater detail as to why they proposed this new theory of what, what might be causing cancers and how to deal with it. All right, I look forward to seeing you guys next time and uh, take care for now, everybody. Ciao.